Good morning, everybody. Uh, good Sunday morning to all of you. My name is Chris Higginson, and I'm the pastor here at Blue Water Church in Concarden, and welcome to our prayer room in our ministry space that we call The Bridge here at uh, 746 Queen Street. It's a real privilege to be able to be here today uh, to share God's word with you. And just before we uh, dig into that, would you just pray with me? Father, thank you today for your word. Thank you that we can spend time looking into it. We acknowledge that it is your word, and so we invite your Holy Spirit to be our teacher today. And so, Spirit of God, would you illumine our hearts and our minds as to the preciousness, the value of your truth. And so, Spirit of God, would you move freely and poke and prod and encourage and equip and console and counsel and convict God as you need to. We don't merely just want to settle for information. We long for the transformation that your spirit brings as you do that work of making us more like Jesus in our attitudes, in our actions. And God, as we've been praying every day, we want to lift up our pastor before you today. We pray for Pastor Dave. We pray healing into his life. And we ask you, great physician, to be active in unmistakable ways that would draw attention to your fame and your grace and your mercy and your goodness. And so, God, we pray for healing. We just pray for this whole family, for Lisa, for Jackson, Matea, that, uh, Spirit of God, you would just hold them up by your, um, by your power, give them your peace, uh, God, would you just um, strengthen them today with your strong right arm. And uh, so, God, we just uh, commit them to you. And so thanks again for a chance to, to be into your word today. God, give us open eyes and ears and hearts and hands to receive what you have for us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As followers of Jesus, we are called to hospitality, to philozenia. Uh, we've talked about that uh, Greek word philozenia uh, for the last uh, couple of weeks anyway. And it comes from Romans chapter 12, verse 13, which is our anchor text. Um, and it says, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. And that word hospitality is the Greek word uh, Paul uses philozenia, philo from phileo, meaning to love, xenia from xenos, meaning stranger, other, foreigner, um, those who are unfamiliar to you and unlike you and uh, different from you. And so the call on the follower of Jesus is to love the stranger, the foreigner, the other, those who are unfamiliar, unlike us, different from us. And so... Uh, what we're gonna do today really is the third part of this little series that we're in called First Impressions. And we're, uh, we're just taking that name, borrowing it from Sobel's Welcome Ministry, because we're talking about welcoming, we're talking about hospitality, but again, not hospitality Martha Stewart style. This is not about whether the napkins match the uh, spoons or whatever. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, we're talking about hospitality, kingdom of Jesus style. And so we're gonna be, uh, again, in God's word, developing a theology of hospitality. And so two weeks ago, we spent a little bit of time in the Old Testament. Uh, we won't rehearse that here this morning, except to say just the upshot that God told the Jewish nation to love um, the foreigner, to love the stranger, to show hospitality, uh, to them, to the vulnerable, to the needy, to the sick, to the poor, to the widow, to the orphan, to love others as they love themselves, to extend um, hospitality to the foreigners living among them and to treat them as if they were natural born Jewish citizens. And there's two big reasons uh, why God, the, uh, God told them to, to do that. And I really appreciate the... Um, Anabaptist theologian Greg Boyd, in some of the work that he's done in this area of hospitality, he, he really draws attention um, to, these, to these two reasons that God gives. Number one, God tells the Jewish people to be hospitable because God's like that. He is 
hospitable. And he loves all, all without partiality. And secondly, the Jewish people ought to be able to remember what it was like when they were strangers and foreigners in a foreign land when they were living in Egypt. And not just that they were strangers and foreigners living in Egypt, but they were enslaved in Egypt. They knew what it was like to be mistreated as strangers and they were enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. And, and so God says, you know, you of all people ought to be able to remember how horrible that was when you were mistreated. So don't treat anybody else like that. In fact, do the opposite. Uh, love others as you love yourself. Love the strangers living among you as if they're natural born Jewish citizens. And so last Sunday, we looked into some New Testament scriptures. We spent some time in Ephesians chapter two. Basically, we saw this very same call to love all indiscriminately and without partiality, to um, extend that to the stranger, to the foreigner for these same two reasons, because God's like that. God is hospitable. He loves all with, without partiality and, and he loves all indiscriminately. And, and we're to imitate him in all that we do. And so we're to imitate God in his hospitality. We're to imitate God in his generosity. We're to imitate God in his self-sacrificial love. And we're to um, imitate that and to extend that love to all others at all times, in all situations, no if, ands, or buts. And then the second thing, we should be able to remember what it was like when we were outsiders, strangers, foreigners to God. And so Paul helped us see in Ephesians chapter two, he helped us see that when we were dead in our sins, God made us alive in Christ. Um, he helped us to see that when we were outsiders, God made us insiders in Christ. When we were foreigners, God made us family in Christ. When we were far away, God brought us near in Christ. How near? So near that we're in Christ. So near that Christ is in us. So near that we are united together with Christ. We're raised with Christ, seated with Christ, complete in Christ. Our lives are hidden with Christ in God. And you can't get closer than that. You can't get closer than in. And then we uh, at least referred, I think, to Ephesians chapter one and verse uh, three, where God just um, unloads this rich treasury of blessing. And it says we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. So now everything that belongs to Jesus by nature now belongs to us by grace. It's pretty good, right? Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending philozenia of God. He loves the poor. He loves the foreigner, the strange, the sick, the disabled, the marginalized, the widow, the orphan. And so we as followers of Christ are called to do the same, to continually put on display his hospitality to love the Zenos, to, 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 to showcase his extravagant love as we welcome outsiders and love the stranger. Um, I love the writings of Henry Nouwen, and he refers to you know, our need to make space in our lives, to cultivate this space where we can welcome in um, and hospitably welcome in the stranger. And so here at Blue Water Church, and I'm having trouble imagining myself at Sobel right now, so I'm probably gonna just like preach this like it's a Blue Water service, if that's okay. And so as I think about our ministry space here, I want this ministry space to be a place where the, where the hospitality of God is absolutely showcased, where his fellow Xenia is just put on display. This ministry space here ought to be the most welcoming place in all of Concarden. This space here ought to be the safest place in all of Concarden. And when I'm talking about the safest place, I'm not just talking about making sure there's nothing to trip on and there, there's no sharp edges and that we've got lots of hand sanitizer. It's really important that the place be safe physically, but there's maybe even a deeper, more profound sense in which in which this needs to be the safest place in town for the most vulnerable, for the most broken, the lonely, the abandoned, 
those grieving loss, those experiencing abuse, the gay teen that's being bullied on social media, the, the husband or the wife whose spouse just left them, people who've been hurt by church in the past, all of them ought to be able to come here and find only safety. They all ought to be able to come here and find only welcome. That ought to be our first impression and our second impression and our only impression that this is a place where it's not just about us and them. It's just us. It's just us. Just, just us human beings, all of us of unsurpassable worth, created in the image and likeness of God and worth Christ dying for. Now, some of you might be thinking um, to yourself, hmm, Higginson, that sounds a little bit soft. You know, don't we need to balance hospitality with a strong stand on holiness and a strong stand on sin? Don't we have to love the sinner but hate their sin? Have you heard that phrase before, love the sinner, hate their sin? It's an interesting phrase. I do hear it um, from time to time. The, the only thing is, the Bible actually doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach love the sinner but hate their sin. The Bible actually teaches the opposite of that. The Bible teaches love the sinner, hate your own sin. And Jesus, he gives us a little exercise to help us with that. Jesus says, when you see sin in somebody else's life, consider it like a microscopic dust particle in their eye. And then it's like he says, you know, just take a deep breath and then think about your own sin and see your own sin like a log, like a two by four sticking out of your own eye. Be grieved about your own sin. And you know, um, you'd be shocked, I think, at how this simple, what we call two by four exercise, and the people around here know exactly what I mean when I talk about the two by four exercise, how that simple exercise in seconds can really revolutionize your capacity to practice philozenia. And so this, even this ministry space, although I'm here all by myself, when it's got people in it again, we want it to be a place, like Paul says in Romans 15, Romans 15, 7, where we accept others just as Christ accepted us, where we welcome others just as Christ welcomed us. Just like the tax collectors and the prostitutes flocked to Jesus because he made space for them, because he welcomed them in. He was a safe place for them to land. And so too, everybody, everybody, regardless of baggage that they're carrying, must find welcome here and must find safety here. Remember the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they fled from the Pharisees, they fled from their judgments, they weren't safe place, but they flocked to Jesus. He welcomed them in, he made space for them in his life, and it was safe space. Well, last week we talked a little bit, as I recall, about what it might be like when we get back to in-person gatherings. And you know what? None of us really know exactly what that's gonna look like or when that's gonna happen or how that's gonna roll out. So we'll need lots of patience and, um, and an ability to be adaptable. But one thing we talked about when we come back to in-person gatherings, what would it look like if we came back having made a commitment to practice kingdom hospitality? What would it look like if we came back with a commitment to not just welcome those with whom we're familiar and comfortable, but to come back with a commitment to welcome those that we don't know or those we don't know well. And what did we say last week? We said, let's, let's bless them. How do we do that? Well, just in our minds, silently, we just pray, we agree with God that this unfamiliar person well, God, I agree with you that they're of unsurpassable worth. They're created in the image and likeness of God and worth Christ dying for. So you just bless them quietly as you pray. And then secondly, you, you greet them. And even in the way that you greet them, you greet them and, and express their worth. Um, you listen to them and listen to them well. And, and how you listen, you express worth. Um, Dallas Willard, again, says that the, that the first act of 
love is the paying of attention to somebody. The first act of love is the paying of attention to somebody. That's hospitality 101. And then, then we just listen to the Christ who is in us. And he'll, he'll lead us, he'll talk to us if we're listening, if we've got eyes to see what he's doing in the moment, he'll help us to see how to express hospitality in that moment. But we did talk about the fact that we'll need to come early to do that, right? We can't come at, uh, well, here our service is at 9.30, so we can't come at 9.29 or 9.35, and uh, you can't come to Sobel at 8, 8.59 and expect to put on display the hospitality of God. And you certainly can't come at 9.05 or 10.59 or 11.05. We wanna come early. And I know that's really hard, you know, especially if you got kids or, or you're traveling a distance or it's winter time. It can be really hard to get there early. It's not impossible, uh, but it is really difficult. I don't know about you, but I'm really forgetful uh, quite often. And uh, you know, it's possible for me to make a commitment to want to practice hospitality on a Sunday morning. And then when Sunday morning rolls around, I just kind of forget all about it. So what I've really started to do was to take um, my phone because there's this lady uh, that lives in my phone. I'm not a techie person but she lives in there and she never forgets anything. And so if I ask her to remind me at 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning about hospitality, uh, she always remembers to do that. Well, what we wanna do this morning and next week is uh, we wanna look at two passages of scripture, one today, one next week. And these are arguably the, the two most uh, famous passages of scripture when it comes to um, hospitality. So we really couldn't, you know, go to the scripture to develop a theology of hospitality without relying heavily on these two texts. And so the one we're going to start with this morning is Matthew chapter 25. So if you've got your Bible, you can uh, open it up to Matthew chapter 25. And while you're doing that, let me just give you a little sense of the context. So in Matthew 25, it's judgment day. Uh, Jesus has returned in his glory. The nations are gathered to him and he's separating people into two groups. And he said it's like a, it's like a farmer who is separating sheep and goats. And so Jesus, uh, the, the, the sheep are at his right hand and he says some things to them and the goats are gathered at his left hand and he says some things um, to them. And let me just say, that this, this teaching of Jesus in Matthew 25, it, it challenges me, it pushes, it pushes against the gospel that I was given, the gospel that I grew up with. It kind of pushes against that a little bit. And I'll maybe talk about that in, in a few minutes, but one thing I have discovered over the years is that whenever the teaching of Jesus pushes against my theology, 100% of the time what needs to change is my theology and never the teaching of Jesus. Matthew chapter 25, I'm gonna read, it's kind of a large section, so just follow along um, as I read, beginning at verse number 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. 
for I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refused to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. So those are the sheep. They're gathered on the right. They're the ones referred to in verse 34 as blessed. They're also, verse 34, said to be set to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Verse 37, they're described as the righteous. They're the ones, uh, verse 40, who are said to have loved and cared for and served the least of these. And the goats gathered at his left hand, they're the ones referred to, verse 41, as cursed ones. Also, verse 41, they're the ones set to be dismissed, to experience fire that's prepared for the devil and his demons. They're the ones, uh, verse 45, who are said to uh, that they did not care, they did not love, they did not serve the least of these. And so Jesus here, in very interesting fashion, he takes, he takes our willingness to love the stranger, to show compassion to the stranger, to serve the stranger in need. Jesus takes that and he makes that the criteria to distinguish between goats and sheep. And what Jesus teaches here in Matthew 25 is similar to what he teaches in other passages as well. It's certainly similar to what he teaches in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm just going to read a few verses beginning at verse 43, Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so Jesus says in Matthew 5, love like the, the Father loves, love like the rain falls and like the sun shines, love indiscriminately and without partiality, so that you'll be recognizable as true children of your Father in heaven. That's the phrase that Jesus uses in chapter 5, verse 45. He says, that way you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. So this ability to love like the Father loves, which, by the way, is an ability that we're given by the grace of God, by the power of the Spirit of God. Um, this ability to love like the Father loves is the defining characteristic of the true child of God now and of the child of God in the future. And so if we're loving now like God loves and we're loving indiscriminately, then we're certainly gonna be loving beyond the confines of just those with whom we're familiar and comfortable. And if we're loving now as the Father loves indiscriminately and without partiality, our love is gonna extend out to the stranger. In fact, it's going to even include the enemy, says Jesus. And so this, this ability to love like the Father loves, that's the distinguishing characteristic of a true child of God. And what is really both perplexing and exciting um, at the same time is how Jesus personally identifies with the stranger in need. Notice he says, when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, when I was naked, when I was sick, when I was uh, in prison, when I was a stranger, Jesus personally identifies with the thirsty, the hungry, the imprisoned, the sick, the naked, the stranger, and so on. So, so that when we're loving the stranger, we're loving Jesus. And when we're feeding the hungry, we're feeding Jesus. His words, not mine. And when we don't feed the hungry, and when we don't love the stranger, 
Well, we're not feeding and we're not loving Jesus. Again, his words, not mine. And so he says to the goats on his left, I was, I was hungry and you didn't give me any food. I was, I was uh, thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was sick and you didn't care for me. I was naked and you didn't share any clothing with me. I was, I was in prison and you didn't visit me. I was a stranger and you showed me no hospitality whatsoever. Jesus personally identifies with the stranger in need. And this is why practicing philosenia, practicing hospitality is so critical to our mission. Because Jesus says he shows up in the stranger. Again, his words, not mine. Now, as I think about this teaching of Jesus, I said I find it challenging and I do, and I just wanna let it soak in I just want to receive it. I just want, I just want Jesus to press it deeply into me. But at the same time, I, I don't want to make Jesus say something that he's not saying. And I think one thing that Jesus is not saying is that these sheep somehow earn the right to enter into the kingdom of heaven because they did good deeds to strangers in need. Jesus is not saying that because nobody earns anything in the kingdom. There's no accounting system in the kingdom. There's no point system in the kingdom. It's not like when I was a kid in Sunday school and there was this one year in Sunday school, I had a very conscientious teacher and, and the teacher had this huge chart on the wall in the classroom. And, and um, so down the, down the left side were all the kids' names. And then across from left to right was um, 52 different columns for each Sunday of the year. And back in those days, it was not unusual for somebody to go to church 52 Sundays of the year. That's what we called regular church attendance. Back in those days, it's, it's very much a different thing now. But uh, beside each kid's name, in each of those 52 columns were five tiny little boxes. And so every week you could get up to five check marks and you could earn points toward prizes. I remember having my eye on this very a uh, handsome set of lawn darts, uh, which probably if you use them now, you'd go to jail, but they were pretty cool back then. And um, so you could get one check mark just for showing up, which I almost always did in my family, unless you were bleeding from the ears, you pretty much went to church Sunday morning. Once in a while, you could fake an illness Sunday evening and maybe mom would stay home with you. Uh, but Sunday mornings, was, it, it pretty much was um, a for sure thing. So you could get a point for showing up. You could get a point for bringing your Bible. And in my family, we we're always, always, every one of us packing our Bibles, our King James Bible. And uh, so we got a point for that. You could also get a point for memorizing your um, memory verse, for reciting it. And I almost always did that. I could almost always learn that on the way to Sunday school. Um, you could get a fourth point for bringing a friend. I almost, almost never did that. Um, in part because, you know, by the time there's seven of us kids in our family, by the time you add mom and dad, that's nine. You squeeze us into the six passenger station wagon. Uh, you probably go to jail for that today. Um, you know, there's really no room to, to pick up other passengers. And so I rarely have ever got that point. The fifth point you could get was for bringing offering uh, money. And I never got that point. Um, I always brought offering but I always kept it because that's what I used to buy hockey cards. Um, so I did pretty good getting usually three out of the five points every week. You know, speaking of hockey cards, I still have the hockey cards. I still look at them. And uh, I always think about, mm, should, I, should I write a check uh, to the church and send it? 25 cents a week for 52 weeks, that's $13. You know, um, with inflation and the passage of uh, 40 plus years, like 47 years maybe, um, that's maybe, I don't know, like $30,000. Maybe thanks to what COVID is doing to the economy, it's back down to $13 so I can maybe send the check. Maybe I can still get the lawn darts. Maybe the chart's still on the wall, I don't know. Um, why did I start telling this story? Oh yeah, because there's no point system in the kingdom. God doesn't have a chart. He doesn't have a big chart and having checking off boxes about little things that were earning. There is no point system. Your right standing with God, my right standing with God is owing entirely and exclusively to grace, to his mercy. You know, when we were dead in sin, God made us alive in Christ only by his grace, only by his mercy. There's no point system in the kingdom. And so what God, what, what Jesus is saying 
in this 25th chapter of Matthew is that these sheep, well, they're welcome into this hospitable kingdom because they themselves were hospitable. They're compatible with the kingdom. They're compatible with this hospitable kingdom. They were welcomed into the kingdom of heaven because they'd already welcomed Jesus in. And they already welcomed Jesus in when they welcomed the stranger in. Now the goats are not welcome into the kingdom of heaven because they're not compatible with the kingdom of heaven. They're, they're dismissed because they'd already dismissed Jesus. And they dismissed Jesus when they dismissed the stranger. See, I used to think that Judgment Day was like God with a gavel, just imposing sentences on people. But as I think about the teaching of Jesus, I, I now see it less of that and more just on that day, God kind of just uh, removing the, the layers and just revealing what is true um, about our character. And so the question on that day is, is your character compatible with God or not? Is your character compatible with the hospitable kingdom or not? And so Jesus is saying that, you know, welcoming and serving and loving the least of these, the hungry, the thirsty, the sick, and so on, that's the criterion in the future, and it's also the criterion now. And so, you know, if we're asking the question, well, how do I know if my character is going to be compatible with the hospitable kingdom on that day of judgment? Well, we answer that question by looking at our life now and asking the question, am I cultivating the kind of heart and mind and lifestyle that is welcoming of Jesus now? And if I am, that's going to be evidenced by the fact that we're welcoming in strangers. And so naturally we'll be compatible with the compatible or with the uh, hospitable kingdom. But the folks who aren't cultivating that now, who aren't practicing hospitality now, who aren't welcoming the stranger now, well, that's going to be evident by the fact that they're not reaching out to those in need. So they'll naturally not be compatible with the hospitable kingdom. And Jesus said in Matthew 25, 40, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Now, I said this theology, uh, this teaching of Jesus, it, 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 it messes with my theology a little bit. It messes with the gospel that I was given, the gospel that I kind of grew up with. The gospel I grew up with was a rather abbreviated gospel. It was, um, it was like a soundbite kind of gospel. It was kind of like, you know, there's some things you got to know, and then you receive Jesus in your heart so that when you die, you go to heaven. That was kind of the gospel I was given. It was um, abbreviated. It was, it was truncated. Um, you know, there, you got to know some things. Jesus is Lord. He died on the cross for your sins. You accept him into your heart as Savior. Um, your sins are forgiven. Then when you die, you go to heaven. Uh, kind of an abbreviated gospel, kind of a North American gospel. And then the way that you kind of um, received that was you would raise a hand or walk an aisle or pray a prayer or fill out a card. It was a, a rather truncated, um, abbreviated, soundbite kind of condensed gospel, I suppose. It would make the Bible a lot shorter. Imagine how quickly you could do your 2020 reading, like in 12 seconds. But what, but what happens here in Matthew chapter 25, as I listen to the teaching of Jesus, it just makes me sit up and take notice that, you know, here's Jesus. He's describing Judgment Day. The, the nations are gathered to him. He's separating them into two groups, the sheep and the goats. And I find it so significant that he doesn't ask one theological question. That's very interesting. I think it would cause us to come to the conclusion that Judgment Day is not just about passing a theology test. In fact, if you think of the sheep in this story, they don't even know that when they're serving uh, the stranger in need, when they're compassionately meeting the needs of the stranger, they don't know that they're doing that to Jesus. They're not aware of that. And so it seems that Judgment Day isn't just simply about what you know. It seems like the gospel isn't just simply 
some things to know that the gospel is not just simply a soundbite of information, that going to heaven is not merely about passing a theology quiz. And again, that kind of just pushes against the, the gospel that I kind of grew up with, that rather truncated North American gospel. And I want to, I guess I'll, I, I'll make a statement here, kind of like I would to our Blue Water family, I suppose. I'm feeling at home here. Um, and I'll overstate it for effect. I'll even kind of state it provocatively just so that we kind of grab this and um, so that we can wrestle with it. I think it's so good for each of us to wrestle with this teaching of Jesus. And I think what, what kind of comes to me from this passage is that, you know, accepting Jesus into your heart doesn't mean a whole lot if you're not accepting the stranger when they're homeless. Accepting Jesus into your heart doesn't mean a whole lot if you're not feeding Jesus when he's hungry, if you're not caring for Jesus when he's sick, if you're not welcoming Jesus in when he's a stranger, if you're not visiting Jesus when he's in prison, if you're not sharing clothing with Jesus when, when he's naked. Again, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And so I guess the question maybe for today is, can we cultivate a mindset that notices and cares about Jesus in the stranger in need? Mother Teresa uh, said it this way as she was, as she was uh, talking about what it is to welcome in Jesus, what it is to receive Jesus. She said it means, and I quote, seeing and adoring the presence of Jesus in the distressing disguise of the poor. Seeing and adoring the presence of Jesus in the distressing disguise of the poor. And so the question is, can we see Jesus in the disguise of the hungry, in the disguise of the naked, the thirsty, the sick, the imprisoned, the stranger? Can we see Jesus in the disguise? Can we see Jesus in the disguise of the disabled person? Can we see Jesus in the disguise of that teenager who's being bullied on social media? Can we see Jesus in the disguise of the newcomer to Canada who is fearful and upon whom some look with suspicion? Can we see Jesus in the disguise of that neighbor whose spouse just walked out on them? Can we see Jesus in the disguise of the elderly lady in the grocery store parking lot who's having trouble getting the groceries into her car? Can we imagine the stranger at Sabo Christian Fellowship walking across the parking lot alone on a Sunday morning when there's people gathering, coming to the door, fearful, unsure because they're new. And as they're standing alone in the lobby, can we see Jesus in them? Can we see Jesus in the disguise of that newcomer as they sit alone in the auditorium? I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And so all of a sudden this thing of welcome and hospitality you know, I remember in week one of this little series, as I was sitting in the Sobel Auditorium and I was thinking to myself as I was saying the words welcome and hospitality that they just sounded kind of weenie and kind of trivial. Well, not so much now, especially since Jesus says he shows up in the stranger in need. That makes it a, a big deal. It's not just something supplemental. Hospitality is not just something superfluous. First impressions is not just a program. It's a big deal. Well, in a few moments, uh, Andy is going to lead in communion. And communion is a beautiful opportunity to express gratitude to God for his extravagant welcome. When we were outsiders, he made us insiders in Christ. When we were foreigners, he came and made us family in Christ. When we were far away, he brought us near. And now we've got a seat at the family table, at the Lord's table.